So today, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Garrett for his third talk. And this was, I think you mentioned this is your more speculative talk or something like this. So of course I needed to do a little bit of research to look at this. And uh, I know that lots of my friends sort of go, oh yes, we do science since I measured one sample and here's what I saw. And you go, oh, that observation. Yeah, isn't that nice? I mean, I have no idea if it's significant, statistically significant or something like that. And of course, a band structure person would be in that sense too, you know. I did a calculation, isn't it just great? It's the best calculation around, it's the nicest method. And again, I go, oh yeah, it's a nice observation, I see. And is that really a good way to do it? But so then with, of course, the materials genome got, let's go to scale and let's do lots and lots and lots of things. And so that was good. I knew that we could be statistically significant with this speaker. And so I just was looking at his publications. And if I just go back over the past 10 years to 2008, he actually has, so machine learning is behind this topic here. And he actually has 10 to nine different papers that say machine learning. Oh, so that's more than six. We're getting up there. And a lot of them are machine learning on band structures and positions and properties of materials and stuff like that. And then I found a paper that had nice methods and it came out in 20, this one's in 2017. Okay, on synthesis insights from the scientific literature. So let's make our papers part of the input of our science. I like this idea, because we know there's lots of them. The methods were very nice, scikit, learn, and TensorFlow. So I told the people in data science class who next year will be, next week will be doing TensorFlow models. Uh, that they might be interested in this talk. But then I saw in this paper that it was only 15,000 papers you looked at, and I was going, ooh, that's not very many, you know? Ah, but now I see our title for today. Phew, now we're really up where we can have some statistical sense of things. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what we can learn from this. And I think actually that these tools are becoming so prevalent and compute power is becoming so easy that it's a way to do a lot of work now. It's sort of like, I don't think it'll be okay when one of my grad students says, I found a paper and it told me what I should do next. You know, Aha, can you find 15,000 papers, you know, please. But. Thanks, Roger. Mm -hmm. Okay, note that the title does not say three million useful research papers, right? <laughs> um, just, just pointing out that subtlety of the language, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, but uh, uh, first of all, I want to say what a great time I had here. This is the, the, the last uh, lecture here, and it's really been sort of, you know, w when I got asked to do this, I was slightly apprehensive, right? Because I go, like, what, three, four days? You want me to spend four days in one place? Who does that anymore, right? <laughs> and and I, I think it, it, it taught me again that, you know, that sometimes science is done slowly, um, that uh, like talking to people for 10 minutes in the hallway or, 25 minutes when you're breezing through a department is not always the way to absorb something. So I think the way that we got here sometimes an hour, sometimes two hours, uh, is really sort of a nice way to sort of kind of absorb a new idea or at least some of the essence of a new idea. So thank you all and thank you to the students who've spent an enormous amount of time uh, preparing for this. Um, so I I'm gonna get to the three million research papers but I was sort of gonna slightly wind back is that um, uh, my um, sort of perspective on machine learning, um, and again, this is all very new, so this could be wrong, that, that obviously in science this is at its best when you don't understand the relation between some input and some output, right? Um, and, and you have to have a lot of data available that has established, explored that relation. If you already know the equations that relate the input and the output, then why would you want to machine learn it, right? So we see a lot of papers in the literature, for example, that machine learn a bunch of results from calculations. And I go like, when I, I can calculate it, why would I want to machine learn it, right? But, but, I, but it's useful to establish methodology, of course. Uh, but there are problems that we truly don't know the input-output out, relation uh, in, in machine learning. And the first one that I sort of thought of a while ago uh, is a hobby of mine. Since I was a graduate student, I thought like it is, would be so cool to predict crystal structure, right? This is this old problem, I have a composition, What's the, crystal, the stable crystal structure? And uh, you know, this is first principles theory was very late to this problem. 
uh, and to actually solving this problem to the point where in 1988, uh, Maddox, who was the editor of Nature at the time, the senior editor, uh, described the um, inability to predict crystal structure as scandal, a scandalous thing in material science that you know, there was a lot of stuff we could do, but crystal structure we couldn't uh, predict. Uh, I think we are probably in a somewhat better situation now, so I should update this slide. Um, and what we had done as students and then sort of later as, as sort of young faculties, you know, we always think of structure prediction as a minimization problem, right? Because it, it's either the, the state that gives you the lowest energy or free energy, right, at finite temperature. And the problem when you approach it that way is that it becomes a mathematical optimization problem. It's basically find the coordinates that give me the lowest free energy. And like many complex optimizations from that suffers from the fact that you cannot globally optimize a function. There is no rigorous math to do global optimization. You can only do local optimization. So we can sort of like, if we're sitting close to an energy well, find which well we'll fall into. But if the real minimum is kind of out there with a lot of bears in between, there is no way that I can uh, systematically find that. You know, and you can do as many genetic algorithms as you want. In the end, you can never prove uh, global uh, optimization. So, so, so we thought like, uh, you know, this is more than 10 years ago. Uh, can we machine learn structure prediction? Because this is one problem on which you have data in material science. There are amazing databases compiled, in particular, the inorganic crystal structure database, where sort of, you know, order 50,000 to 100,000 relations between input and output has been established, right? chemistry, input, crystal structure, output. So can a machine learn the rules the way that Linus Pauling and Hume Rothery kind of looked at things and says, oh, if I have this ratio of things, uh, of anions to cation ratios, I get certain crystal structures. So the, the first way we tried to do this uh, uh, was the work that Chris Fisher uh, uh, did when he was a grad student with me, uh, was try to learn it through Bayesian inference. And, and here was the idea. Let's say I have a ternary system. And I know a few crystal structures in it, right? And this is a, a typical situation. The system's been explored. There's a few uh, compounds known. The question is, could I predict other compositions where I would find compounds, and could I predict their crystal structure? And so uh, the way we thought about this is, you know, uh, could you define some kind of probability density? Let's say these, these, these variables, x1, x2, are outcomes at different stoichiometries. If you if you could combine this uh, global probability density, which is basically the probability that they occur in a phase space together, if you knew that function, then you would be able to predict structure because you would basically condition it on known information. Your prediction is then literally the conditional probability, this x vector, based on what I know, which is maybe three points, right? And that would be your, your sort of maximum uh, entropy prediction. So and then, as always, right, like we, we make some mathematical formulation, but then, of course, we don't know this function, right? And so the idea was, can we build up as much as possible of this function based on the known information, right? which is this, this 100,000 known crystal structure assignment. Uh, we were very naive at the time. You know, Machine learning was like not something we actually had heard of. We didn't even call it machine learning at the time. And, and all these things like TensorFlow and all this stuff and, and uh, didn't really exist. Neural networks existed, but I had barely heard of them. So we did something really trivial, a cumulant expansion, right, which is essentially expanding this in sort of point and pair and higher order cumulant probabilities, and then sort of finding the distribution with maximal entropy, which is really, what you're really saying is, I, I want to try to find the distribution that, 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 that gives, uh, that represents the known information, but with minimal bias, right, with minimal extra information. So, so we sort of did that, and, and what was kind of int interesting is that the result contained physically identifiable information. So I'll, I'll show you a few cumulants. So a cumulant, really what it tells you here is that two phases occur uh, in the same system with much higher probability than average, right? And so here's one. This cumulant tells you that if you find the magnesium copper two structure at some composition in a binary, you are very likely to find the Fe3C type structure at the, at the AB3 composition. Right? So actually, like almost nine times more than random. And if you know a little bit of like metallurgy, you know why this is. This is a size controlled structure. This is a structure you get when you have large and small atoms. And so is this. Right? So in some sense, the system learns that if you have a size controlled structure, oh, there are other size controlled structures more likely to show up. 
and, it's and at the right stoichiometry. So it picks up this kind of basic physics, but in a mathematically unbiased way. I don't have to put in that physics, right? If I use the hume rodri rules, if I use the Pauling rules, I'm kind of deciding on physics that I use, right? OK, so um, we try to do predictions with that. And, and something I'm, I'm going to show more and more is the way we actually do predictions is not like we don't say, here's the answer for a given composition. We sort of do it probabilistically. And, and I'm going to show you plots like this, which is I'm going to make a list of predictions because basically the algorithm says this is the most likely candidate for the crystal structure. This is the second most. This is the third most, et cetera. So this is the length of that list, you know, 10 all the way to 60 here. And then this here is the probability that the right answer is on that list. And here's why this is important. We don't really need the right answer from probability theory. Because if we have a list of 10 or 20, we just calculate them with density functional theory. If we have a finite list, the problem is basically solved for us because we just calculate their energy. And so um, there's sort of three things on here. Uh, DMSP is the technique we use. So data mine structure prediction is the, is the uh, blue line. This is if you randomly guess. And this is if you guess based on the multiplicity of structures, how common they are in nature. And what you see is kind of remarkable, right? That if, if you're willing to make, allow me to make a list with 10 candidate structures, 95% of the time, the correct structure is actually on that list. And so for practical purposes, that actually solves the problem. Because if I, I just have to make 10 calculations at each composition and I'm done and I predict the ground state, essentially with 95% accuracy. So, so, so this approach worked. Uh, it, it, it was difficult to scale. And so we went to another kind of data mining approach about sort of four or five years later. And this is the one I've shown in earlier talks is uh, what we wanted to learn is actually, um, you could call it chemical similarity. So if you have two compounds that form the same crystal structure, like A2B306 and A2C306, then you're learning something that B and C can be substitute for each other. So if you see this a lot of times, you, you, you can build almost like a chemical similarity measure for crystal structure, right? And so you, you look in the database that, like things, and again, you do this sort of automated, you see a bunch of spinels, right? Cadmium, manganese, oxide. This is a tetragonal spinel, zinc, manganese, oxide. And of course, what the computer is essentially learning from this is that cadmium, zinc, and magnesium can substitute for each other while retaining the crystal structure, right? So it's a similarity metric with the, with the criterion that it needs to retain uh, the crystal structure. And so uh, you can essentially data mine the ICSD. Uh, and I think, let me actually, that slide comes first. And you can sort of build these similarity plots where the high intensity colors, the yellowish and reds, are essentially uh, abilities for ions to substitute for each other. And I showed this uh, yesterday for those who were here. And you find there's a few that, that are really red, like you know, calcium and barium, right, substitute. We kind of know that. Uh, and again, these are uh, the lanthanides, right? A lot of them substitute. This, is what, by the way, was based on oxide crystal structures. And this block here is the transition metals, where, where there's obviously more substitution ability than average, but it's not perfect. And the way we can now use this, we can invert the structure problem. So rather than starting with a composition and finding the crystal structure, we start with a lot of crystal structures, and we find which ones we can substitute to the target composition. And then we kind of know the likely candidates for crystal structure. And this one, because it's sort of independent of dimensionality of number of components, is the one we actually uh, practically use. And if you test it in oxides, again, making a list like this, this is now done in uh, ternary oxides. You know, now we need to go to longer lists. But again, with about 20, a length of 20 crystal structures, we can be about 90% accurate in structure prediction. And, 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 and this is. Uh, a remarkable tool, right? Because when we do high throughput computation, high throughput sort of searching for new compounds, we need a fast structure prediction, right? Because we're going to run through 50,000 compositions. We cannot do a giant molecular dynamic simulation or genetic algorithm, which takes you know 30,000 density functional theory calculation each. We cannot do that for every point in chemical space. So we need something uh, fast like this. Okay. So um, since this kind of worked and, and, and became practical. Um, I, I sort of wanted to, uh, a few years went by, and, and, and when I sort of got interested in synthesis, I sort of thought back at this, could I do this for synthesis? But of course, for synthesis, you have no data, right? There is no good database on, on synthesis. And that sort of led me into this idea, like, can we extract knowledge from, from the scientific literature, right? Can you, 
have a machine read papers and, and, and learn specific things from it. So I'm first going to go through some sort of like easy fun stuff and then make it uh, a little harder. And of course, this is the domain of what's called natural language processing, NLP, uh, which is essentially the area of artificial intelligence that, that deals uh, with language. And I was going to show you an example, right? So you all have texting on your cell phone. And, and I was going to um, show you a conversation I had with my wife, who's also a professor at UC Berkeley on text, right? And so uh, she's actually in the store. You know, we have weird schedules, right? It's 12.50 PM, but she's shopping, and I'm thinking about beer. Um, so you know, um, she asked me, shall I buy beer too? She's in the shop, and I said, sure, but make sure it's good beers, right? And we talk about suggestions, and I say, maybe some Leffe, some Duval. I particularly like Golden Drac, if you've ever had it. It's a really good beer. OK, she says, OK. And then I type, I'm coming home four. And you know that, that your text app is going to suggest something, right? Like it, it suggests, what's it going to suggest? Beer. I'm coming home for beer. <laughs> Seems like the likely <laughs> one, right? <laughs> but so it actually makes these three suggestions. I'm coming home for dinner. I'm coming home for you. And A, because that's actually always an easy next word to do, right? But essentially, this is a form of natural language processing. We'll come to later how it sort of learns these things. But natural language processing is essentially using the fact that language is not a random connection of words, right? If you imagine if a vocabulary had only 10 words in it, right? Let's do this simple. And I had a sentence of five words. Then in principle, I have the, 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 the number of combinations I have is 10 to the fifth power, right? Because in every word position, I can put 10 words. But of course, that's not how language works, right? So the, the actual dimensionality of natural language is much less than you think it is, right? And that's what natural language learns to uh, exploit. And that's how it builds things like this. OK, so um, what the, the technique that Google pioneered is word to vec and, 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 and word to vec is essentially this thing that you condense the dimensionality of natural language into a lower space, if I can sort of uh, paraphrase it a bit. Um, and, and there are sort of classic examples, right? So this is actually done in a, automatically in a fairly high dimensional space, but we can only show pictures in low dimensional space, right? And here's a classic example. If I, what you want to do is you want to turn words, you want to position words into a vector space. Right? Because if you have coordinates on them, you can operate them. You can figure out distances between them, relations between them. And that's essentially what word to vec does. You know, for once, Google named something to what, by what it actually is, right? Word to vectors, right? not Google. Um, OK, let's say you have positions for Paris, France. And so you could ask, what's the relation between them, right? I mean, it could be a lot of things. It would be like, you know, when I go to France, I like to go to Paris, right? That could be a relation. But a, a very logical relation is, is the capital of. So what, what in word to vec you can do is that if you take this distance vector, that distance vector means is the capital of. So if I take that vector and I add it to Italy, right, then you hope that I'll get Rome. And this is one of these examples, right, that actually kind of works. And, and the way this works is because if you make a machine read an enormous amount of, of, of text, it essentially learns uh, the, the sort of environment in which these words and the relation in which these words occur when they are in a short distance to each other. Right? So this does not work with very long-term memory. And the example I always give right, is like, you, know, um, it, it, you can say, I, I was born in China. And if the next sentence is, and I speak, XXX, it'll say Chinese. But if you write a whole essay and it starts, I was born in China, and then you write three pages about like, you know, what signs you like, and then you say, you know, I speak that 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 natural language processing isn't gonna do the squat for you, right? Because it cannot do uh, really well that long-term memory. So we thought the first thing we wanted to do is can we learn science from just reading text and treating it as text. And this is an important distinction to what I'm going to do later, where I'm going to interpret the text. So for now, text is just strings. So when it says silicon dioxide, it doesn't know that that's SiNO2. It just knows that that's a string, right? So we read first a bunch of abstracts. The reason is abstracts are freely available. You don't need licenses. You know, abstracts you can just uh, pull uh, from the web online. OK. So we, we, we basically build a vector space for words, and we try these tests. OK. And this is a quiz here, right? I said this is going to be lighter. My, my. OK. Iron oxide minus iron, that's the vector. And I add that to silicon. What should I find? Silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide. Good. OK. Excellent. You're as good as the computer. 
or the computer says it's <laughs> OK. Here's my question. OK, pressure minus PA plus HZ. Very good. Very good. So it learns that there are abbreviations for things, right? OK, this one we kind of did, right? This is basically oxide, right? OK, this one. This one actually is a little more remarkable. Lithium cobalt oxide, did you pay attention to my first lecture, right? Minus cathode plus anode is? Yeah, close. Graphite. Yeah, very good, right? So it learns that lithium cobalt oxide is a cathode. So you could, you could almost think of this like is the material is, and then anode me, it goes to graphite. OK, this one is really good. This one I was shocked at. By the way, this works about 50% of the time, and I'm showing you only the ones that work. <laughs> OK, so BCC minus iron, right? That means the crystal structure of this thing, right? What is lanthanum? Yes, very good. You must teach material science, right? <laughs> It's double HEP, and it actually gets picked up in the word to vec, which I was kind of surprised at. And here you go, like zinc blend, gallium phosphide. Gallium, that means gallium nitride. So word to vec can essentially encode very basic knowledge, right? And again, like I said, this, I'm actually surprised this works 50% of the time, roughly. It makes a lot of silly mistakes. And when it makes mistakes, they're obviously completely idiotic, right? Because it just thinks of things as strings, right? You know, it could be, it could be saying mushroom here, right? If it, for some reason, mushroom ends up near anode because it, it doesn't really know that mushroom is not a material. It just thinks of it uh, as a string. OK, and then you can do cute stuff, right? I mean, remember, this lives in a high dimensional space. So whenever I want to show you something, I have to project it down, right? So you can cluster elements. And again, we're not learning chemistry here, right? We're just treating them as strings. And what you see is that if you project them, similar elements kind of go together, right? You know, here are the noble gases. Here's sort of the, the lanthanides. Uh, here's sort of some of the main group elements. Now, there are elements where you always have a problem with, right? Beryllium, because that means B. It's an English word, right? Aluminum is often confusing. So there are several of those that we struggle with in, in the later part of the talk, uh, as I'll see. OK, so we did want to do a serious test with this. And the question is that we wanted to ask, does the literature embody future predictions without actually making them, right? That's the question we're trying to answer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the body of text up to a certain time. I will artificially cut it off and try to see if I can use this to make a prediction of what comes later. And the one in particular that I'm going to do is I'm going to try to predict new thermoelectric materials based on what was said before, except I remove all mention of that material uh, if, if it were to be there, but even anything related remotely to things like thermoelectrics, like words like power factor and Z-Beck coefficients and stuff like that, right? So I, I, I'm trying to, uh, as fair as possible, make sure that the machine doesn't really learn anything about that it's a thermoelectric. And so the question is, can I predict thermoelectrics that will be studied later? Okay. And the answer is actually you can. And this is sort of a complicated curve, and we're only going to focus on the gray lines. So for example, what, let's say that take the 2014 curve. What this predicts is if I take the body of literature up to 2014, right? how many years later, uh, so and then I start looking one year later, three years later, five years later, how many of my predictions have actually been studied as a thermoelectric, as a new thermoelectric? And what's amazing that within five years, 30% of the materials that I predict have actually been studied as a thermoelectric. So unfortunately, as scientists, we seem to be predictable, <laughs> right? And, and again, these materials were not known as thermoelectrics, right? And we can go a bit in details whether they are good thermoelectrics, but the more fun thing is to show how the, how the, the, the word to vec makes those predictions. And, and, and here's a sort of like reduced correlation that I'm trying to plot. These were three predictions made, these three materials, right? And, and, and this is some of the terms that it uses to connect to thermoelectricity without actually knowing it's a thermoelectric. And now it starts to make sense, right? OK, so this guy here, right? OK, it sees it in context of studies on band gap, on chalcogenide photovoltaics. There's a big relation between photovoltaics and thermoelectric because they often have similar band gaps, right? So it starts to learn why somebody studied this material for photovoltaics. Somebody later is going to study it for thermoelectrics. OK, this one is purely compositional based. You know, copper 7 telluride, there's a ton of like copper and tellurium based systems uh, as compounds. This is kind of an easy one. 
That compound had not been studied in the period where we looked, but it sees it's kind of like appears in strings similar to other compounds, so it knows the thermoelectric. This one, which is metallic, uh, it basically figures out because it's a Heuschler compound. Many Heuschler compounds have been studied as thermoelectrics. But it's sort of remarkable that there's sort of a beginnings here of knowledge, right? That, that the computer learns simply by assimilating vocabulary. Uh, keep in mind, we are not interpreting these words, right? We, we, we are not saying that you know, uh, uh, a certain band gap is good for thermoelectrics. We're just looking at word association. OK, so, so that's kind of fun. We're sort of playing with this. And, and I'm not totally sure where we're going to take this, to be honest. Uh, this was sort of fun. Uh, uh, it, it may connect to a question I'll maybe pose at the end that a lot of machine learning we do seems very good at picking up things that are in short-term memory. You can study short-term correlations. It, it's extremely hard in machine learning to infuse background knowledge, which is what we unfortunately all use to do science. Well, fortunately for us, unfortunately for the machine, right? So, so, so the more complicated problem that I started to tackle was um, I want to learn synthesis, and I, I brought it up in yesterday's talks where we, where we do that through a deductive scientific approach. But there was sort of this question, can we learn it just from synthesis recipes in the literature in the way we learn crystal structure prediction from data? Of course, the, 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 the first problem is that you need to get the data. I think I said this, uh, you know, the reason I'm doing this is because I think we're pretty good with ab initio materials predictions, but then we predict an awful lot of stuff we can't make, right? And I don't want to look like a fool for too long. OK, so codifying what's synthesizable uh, is really challenging. And again, I, I sort of briefly mentioned that we have plenty of examples now of materials we can't really make, even though they're kind of lowish in energy. So it's not like they're completely ridiculous structures. OK, uh, I talked about the distinct approaches. That one, I think that's never going to work. That one I talked about yesterday. And today, I want to talk about the data-centric one. Right? Now, if you want to learn from synthesis data, uh, I hate to say you spend most of your time getting the data. And, and this is an unfinished project, so that's my excuse. So we have a little bit of machine learning at the end, but I'm going to show you a lot about how you teach a machine to actually learn to read the data, which turned out to be the biggest problem. OK, so this is a big project. Um, I am not nearly as good as Christine Pearson set up a large scale project, but I've learned a little bit from her. So we have this sort of pipeline we've built, you know, which goes all the way from content acquisition, because papers, of course, you can't just steal from the web, right? You need license to them. Uh, parsing them, I'll talk a bit about them, but not much. Uh, and then finding out where synthesis is described. Uh, and then the hardest part is really recipe extraction. I'll spend most of uh, my time on that. So uh, the first part is, um, is uh, negotiating with the publishers. Uh, we had a great librarian. Well, we still have her, but she's on maternity leave for now, unfortunately for us. And, and, uh, and, and she helped us negotiate all kinds of like text mining agreements with the publishers. Uh, we have access to a bit over 3 million papers. Um, uh, Elsevier, of course, is the big dog in the room, right, when you do science. Uh, and, and, and you see negotiations with Elsevier are not going well, as you may have heard. Um, we are actually, this is a bit old, we are almost at 100% extraction rate for all these publishers. That does not mean we take all their papers. We manually tag papers that may have materials content in them. So, you know, we don't read the, the journal of, I don't know, social anthropology or something like that, right? So, so we tag them and then those we go through. Uh, and then we sort of parse them and I'll, I'll say a little bit about them. Uh, and, and a lot of these are, are tools we build ourselves. The reason is that a lot of the publishers are, they are, our experience is that they are open to text mining, but they are not familiar with it yet. So they make all kinds of weird agreements with you. Uh, like we really have agreements you can only extract papers from you know, Saturday night, 11 p.m. to Sunday morning, 5 a.m. because nobody is up doing any work and our servers don't get overloaded. Or you can only extract one paper every three seconds and stuff like that because they don't want to overload their server. So that's just a bunch of coding that you have to take care of, right? Okay, so we have another issue that the way that people publish has changed, right? So since roughly about 2000, papers tend to be available in HTML markup language. Uh, uh, before that, there was a sort of short period where they got published as PDF with text embedded essentially. So, but before that, I hate to say, it's all like scanned copy. So it's photographic, right? So we started here. And turned out that this was a really already hard problem that that created so much parsing errors that, that, that we just didn't want to deal with at the time. So we have moved our boundary <coughs> to here. So we now are reading papers from 2000 onward. Uh, we are going to go back to this, but there are some really serious formatting problems. Uh, and this one is, is a bit problematic too. Uh, 
you know, I'll give you some examples. Sometimes parsing of PDF, even with embedded text, is quite hard. You know, like uh, it, it has all kinds of uh, codes that, that confuse the computer. Like 700C can look like 7008C, which is a very different temperature than 700C. <laughs> um, you know, scanned uh, OCR, uh, optical character recognition, is really good at plain text. Today, you know, you can give a printout of Shakespeare and OCR is really good. It is not very good with formulas, with two column format. So we decided to defer this problem. And if somebody knows how to solve this problem, if you read formulas in, in scanned, uh, in photographic PDF, you get a lot of garbage quite easily. Uh, supposedly, Google has solved this problem, but we have not gotten access to it, to whatever tools they have. They actually have scanned old patents where the chemistry is almost perfect. So they clearly have, either they have solved this problem, that, or, they, or they've had a lot of undergraduates uh, fix things. Uh, OK, so the question is, uh, are we, uh, how complete are we? So this is a, a histogram of papers that mention synthesis either in the text or in the abstract um, and, and as a function of time. Uh, this, is, uh, this is our error. There was no singularity in 1990, um, uh, whatever the government was then. But this really should continue like this. But either way, uh, first of all, the shocking thing about this graph is that um, the world has gotten more competitive. If you feel that science is more competitive, here's your answer. Uh, there are just a lot more papers being published every year. It is, this shocked me. I thought this would be a much less increasing function. But so it turns out that if we cut off at 2,000, uh, I probably have to lower this. We probably have 70 or 80% of all papers ever published, which is kind of crazy, right? The question is where we have the important ones, which is not the same uh, question, right? OK. So I, I want to give you a flavor of some of the challenges for those of you who are going to sort of doze off later so you get a sense of how hard this is. So the first thing you have to do is you got this paper, and you have to find where synthesis is described. And you cannot just look for keywords, let me tell you, because when you do that, you get all kinds of garbage. You know, people have keywords, like people talk about synthesis in figure captions. It says the synthesized samples are blah, blah, blah. Um, people talk about synthesis even in acknowledgments, right? And so you need something a little more sophisticated. So that's the first part, finding where synthesis is described. Uh, and then you need to sort of you know, read through this. right? Read, I mean, read through this and figure out how hard this is for a computer. right? Because what do I want? In the end, I want an algorithmized, I want a codified synthesis recipe, something that's like an algorithm. right? I take this, I take that, I mix them, I grind them at 300 RPM. And so OK, you start reading this. right? So you have to decode abbreviations, right? GZO, right? Like, how do you know what GZO is? Well, you figure it out by reading what starting materials they put in, right? But the computer can't sort of use that because it will make way too many mistakes. And, and then you read a bunch of, so these are the precursors, right? But you read a bunch of other chemicals, right? There are zirconium oxide balls used in the ball mill. There's ethanol used in the ball mill. So how does the computer know that that's not part of the synthesis recipe, right? So, so it's not like you can just take all the chemicals. And then there are operations, right? Drying, sintering, calcining. And these operations have attributes, right? They have uh, 500C here, 950C here for five hours. And then you have to sequence the operations. Luckily for us, scientific writers are slightly simplistic. They write most of the time in order, right? Most of the time they write, they sequence, they're sort of like, you know, I do this, I do, it's like a, you're six year old, right? I went to school, I went to first period, I went to second period, right? And that's good for us. That's about 85% of the time. We still have 50% of the time where I hate to say somebody writes a synthesis paragraph, does all these things, and then says, by the way, oh, and we dry the precursors at 200 Celsius. And they say that at the end, right? Computers get totally confused by that because here's an operation at, said at the end, which really has impact on the beginning, right? OK. So, um, so identifying kind of what a word is, whether it, it's, it, in our case, it's a, a precursor or the target of synthesis or an operation, that falls under the category of what's called named entity recognition. And again, that's a form of NLP, which essentially decides what something is. And again, in, in typical natural language, this is quite easy. If I read uh, here the sentence, John Rogers traveled to Paris and bought a $500 suit, I don't think you can do that in Paris. but um, <laughs> so. Uh, you can tokenize that to, you know, something will come out, well, John Rogers must be a name, Paris must be a place, and $500 is an amount, right? And so you start in natural language tokenizing things like that because then 
you can start treating them with some amount of uh, meaning. Okay, so uh, here's our problem. So we're going to have to tokenize things. We're going to have to figure out these are operations, these are temperatures, these are you know precursor chemicals and stuff. So, but ours is a much harder tokenization problem because first of all we have non-unique representation. You know, people will say lithium manganese oxide spinel, but then somebody will uh, write LMO, right, for lithium manganese. Uh, doping is the worst, right? Please come up with a consistent way of writing how you dope materials, right? Because people will say ABC colon D, right? People will say D doped ABC. People will say ABC with some D added, stuff like that. So doping is completely unstandardized. And that's actually been a major, a, a big challenge uh, for us. Um, syntax grammar is all over the place, right? So you can't really use that as a template. Um, you know, the same sentence can do very different things. Like here it says barium titanate is prepared from TiO2 and barium carbonate. And so you go like, well, that's like a perfect template from a synthesis reaction, right? This is the material that's being made and these are the precursors. But then you read this, the battery is prepared from electrodes and electrolytes, right? So this is not a synthesis reaction per se. It's not chemistry, right? Uh, and here's a good one, right? You need implicit knowledge. So yttrium oxide was added to the system. That could be as a precursor as a grinding media, sometimes it's added as a donor impurity, right? So again, if you read the, sen the sentence by itself, it's the same sentence, but you really don't know uh, what it meant. Uh, and then there's sort of ambiguous designation. Sometimes, you know, uh, people, things refer to things high, uh, said in, in, in previous parts of the paper. Sometimes they are just uh, a broad context. So the first thing we had to develop, so we want to, in the end, do real chemistry with this. So we need to be able to interpret material strings, right? If you, if you treat a chemical as a string, it's not that hard. But remember, if I read barium carbonate, later I want to know that is barium carbonate. I want to get an enthalpy of reaction from that and stuff like that. So we have to turn strings into composition vectors. And so we wrote a new uh, materials entity recognition parser, uh, which is much better than the standard one, chem data extractor, which doesn't really work that well. And we're about to probably in a few months release it to the public. And it does stuff like that, right? You know, people write stuff like this, right? Magnesium X, aluminum 2X. And you have to sort of parse that this is in some sense a vector of compositions, right? With different values of X. So we can sort of parse that and store that as an object. Um, sorry, let me go back to it. People write stuff like this, right? Nickel 2 and manganese 2 acetates. You have to turn that into chemistry, right? So you have to know what an acetate is. Um, you know, you, there's a bunch of these, oh, sometimes there are composites, right? Or people write them as composites, but it's not even clear that they are composites, right? That's just a choice. So people here write this barium titanate with barium sodium titanate, and then this thing mixed in, and is this, is this like a solid solution, or is this a composite? You cannot add extra information to the paper, right? That's the thing. So we store this as a, uh, we have a hierarchical way of storing this as a composite. OK, there's a bunch of other ones, so I, I'll, I'll spare you the details. OK. Oh, PZT, that's my favorite one, right? You know, nobody ever says what PZT is anymore. <laughs> nobody says what PZT is anymore. So we have long lists of abbreviations that have been, that we sort of figured out. Like, OK, so there's some amazing chemicals you find in the literature, right? I'm going to stand back on these because um, uh, you discover many new materials. <laughs> uh, Cooper oxide was uh, one of them. Polyvinyl betrayal. Um, you know, I'm not an organic chemist. I just hope it's not real and I'm making fun of it here. Uh, magnesium. Uh, Phyosulfate. Uh, Oxooxalate. That's oxalate with an extra oxygen, I think, right? <laughs> Tetrabutytitanate. Um, ethylene. I, I can't even pronounce that. Um, there's just way too many letters there, right? And I love this. I can't pronounce it, butyl phthalate or something like that. So, um, so what I've learned from kind of like text mining and high throughput computing, that the extremes are almost always wrong, right? Things that you, singular things that you find or extreme are usually the errors that you find. And, 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 and I still remember my, my student came to this who said, you know, he made plots of all kinds of chemicals made and precursors. And he says, and there's this bunch of them that are really rare. They're only used once in a reaction. And he shows me the list, and it's basically a list like this. And I go like, well, they're, they are extremely rare in, in reality. <laughs> <laughs> uh, OK, so uh, the first thing is finding where synthesis is descri described. I have a student working on, on this. And, and the way we do that is, is by a combination of uh, unsupervised and supervised learning. Uh, the unsupervised part is that we essentially um, 
make topical uh, clustering of sentences. So we read sentences, and I'll show that actually here, uh, and, and we actually look at word occurrence and we build clusters of word occurrence. And again, it's totally done by the computer. So the computer essentially finds that some words tend to occur together in a sort of simple way of saying. And that's totally done unsupervised. You, you don't have to tell the computer. So for example, here's a sentence, right? The potters were uni actually pressed into pellets, blah, blah, blah. And basically, uh, a lot of these words tend to occur together. And we call that a topic. Again, you know, the computer decides it's a topic, but we call it pelletizing, but again, for the computer, it's just topic 327, right? Uh, and what a topic really is mathematically, it is a probability distribution over words. So in some topics, certain words occur with very high probability, right? Like if you have a topic about cooking, there's probably about salt and pepper and, you know, mixing or something like that. And then, for example, you read this sentence, sintered in sealed crucible, etc. Those also appear as a topic, and we call that sintering. There are actually many sintering topics in our, in our thing. Um, and again, it doesn't matter what we call it, but, but we essentially let the computer divide sentences in probability distributions over topics. So that's the unsupervised part, that every sentence becomes labeled with a topic distribution. And then we build essentially uh, decision trees, and this is supervised in the sense that um, we, have a, we, we have my group once in a while eat pizza, and, and we've built a, what's called a mechanical Turk, which is a way of annotating. So basically, they read a paragraph, and they're asked the question, is this synthesis, is this not synthesis? And then for, for the smarter ones, we ask them, like, is this solid state synthesis, or is this hydrothermal synthesis, or something? And so we label a bunch of paragraphs, which can be used for training the data. And from that, we actually build uh, uh, decision trees. And you know, like, this is a kind of an example of a decision tree, and there are many outcomes, right? In this case, we, we wanted to distinguish four things, solid state, hydrothermal, using a solid gel precursor of none of the above. And you see, for example, if you think solid state, there are many parts in the tree where you come out as solid state. And you do this over many, many trees. Uh, but I like to show the, the top point, because that is an early decision point that something is solid state. And it turns out it's this one. If you have ball milling followed by heating, so if you have the topic ball milling, followed by heating, that's almost always solid state synthesis. So the computer kind of figures that out. You know, I'm sure here it's solid state synthesis. OK. So um, uh, how do we do when we look at um, how we do in terms of classifying paragraphs? Uh, this problem is, works reasonably well. So for example, do we find that something is solid state synthesis? We have a precision of about 94%, the recall of about 90 So precision is basically a measure of uh, if I take 100 paragraphs and I label as solid state synthesis, which, how many of them are actually solid state synthesis? Recall is essentially a measure of how many have I missed. So I've missed about 10% that are solid state synthesis that I didn't find. Uh, if you're going to do data mining, precision is sometimes more important than recall, but it doesn't really matter. So, okay, so we can essentially get four types of synthesis that we extract for now. Okay. So then comes you know, uh, the hard part. I have the synthesis paragraph. I now need to start extracting what all these words mean and what their, 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 their relation and meaning is in the synthesis recipe. So if you go, for example, here, right? So I, could, I, I first could run through this and try to figure out a bunch of chemicals. There's lithium titanate, amorphous TiO2, lithium carbonate, acetone appears, a gel appears, air appears, because air can be a chemical too, right? And then you have to figure out, so you have to recognize what are materials. That's the first thing. That we know how to do quite well. But the harder part is understanding the role of these materials. So you have to understand that this is the target of synthesis. Target turned out to be one of the harder things to identify uh, in some parts because it's not even mentioned in the paragraph, right? There's somebody writes a paper, I make uh, you know, lithium cobalt oxide, and then when they describe the synthesis, they just say the material was made by mixing lithium carbonate and cobalt oxide. And, and again, computers don't have long-term memory. So you have to almost explicitly build that in that the paper is about lithium cobalt oxide and that that's probably what they refer to when they say the material. So we don't do that today because we don't want to infer too much from the data that's not explicitly stated. Um, so you have to distinguish between targets, precursors. These are the, the precursors. And then this stuff is media, right? This is auxiliary stuff in the synthesis, right? You're actually not like reacting it, but you're reacting in it or so. And then you have to sequence the operations and stuff like that. Okay, so the way we do that is with neural networks. Uh, we use what's called the LSTM, so long short-term memory uh, neural networks. They are bi-directional. Uh, they are literally, so what we're actually literally gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna take a sentence which 
practically we turn into word to vec, but that's less important. And we're really going to push it through a neural network. And the neural network is at, at any word is going to roughly tell us what it thinks that word means, right? And it uses the context around it because that has set the previous state of neural network. It's bidirectional, which is really important. And the reason is that language is bidirectional, right? Sometimes you say uh, lithium cobalt oxide was synthesized from blah, blah, blah. And sometimes you say we used lithium oxide and, um, and uh, cobalt oxide to make lithium cobalt oxide, right? So now the target is at the end of the sentence before it was at the beginning. So you truly need to, just because of the English language, you can make passive, you can make active, you need to be bi-directional. Uh, okay, so uh, one trick is that we do a two-step extraction. We first turn every word that is a material into material. Uh, and that's actually to uh, reduce bias. So um, uh, the, the, the input to the neural network that decides what something means doesn't actually know the chemistry. It just knows this is a material. We call this simplified language. And the reason is the following. If I take this sentence, skull melting was used in the synthesis of zirconium oxide, uh, most neural networks that you train a lot of data will classify zirconium oxide as a media. And the reason is there's an awful lot of zirconium oxide ball milling being done. And so most of the time, zirconium oxide is balls for a medium. And so if you, if you put that there as a chemistry, the neural network is so overtrained to think of that as a medium. So if you replace this by material, it actually classifies it as a target it, because it now understands that the syntax now dominates, right? Skull melting was used in the synthesis. I mean, this isn't rocket science, right? The sentence says the synthesis of, right? But you just see like, in some sense, you know, machine learning sounds like really intelligent, but it's actually not particularly intelligent, right? It's just fast. Okay, so here's like a neural network, right? You push the sentence through here. And this is actually the state of, of one of the cells that indicates precursor. And as soon as it starts to, to see this part, right, what's prepared from, it starts to up its intensity that what's coming must be precursors. Because what's prepared from, it's really getting trained that that means the precursors are coming. Okay. So um, again, we do that by labeling data, right? We have people sitting in a room labeling paragraphs. This is the precursor. This is the, uh, the, the target. And by the way, there is noise on labeling, right? If you ask five people to label 100 paragraphs, you will not get the same answer. So there's a certain input noise that you cannot do better at. OK, so um, from that, we get a recipe, like a cooking recipe, right? Um, and how do we do? OK. So, on, on, on materials in general, we have a, a kind of precision of in the 93% uh, precursors. Uh, I think we are now doing better. I should really update this. And targets, we're sort of in the 90%. This is good, but not amazing. And the reason is, think about it, right? A synthesis recipe has like 10 things in it, right? If I have a 10% error on one of them, I don't have a lot of correct synthesis recipes, right? So I need to do really well on my uh, extraction. OK, so how do we compare to other techniques, right? If you just did something simple like chem data extractor, uh, which I call the baseline here, there is much poorer uh, extraction on uh, what are materials and precursors. And in particular, targets are very, chem data extractor really, in some sense, cannot distinguish a target of a synthesis with uh, a precursor. OK, so here's where we are. Um, we are, we have now, um, this number changes every day because sometimes it goes up, sometimes it actually goes down because we find errors. Um, we have about 17,000 solid state reactions. So we have focused uh, on the end of the pipeline just on solid state. We are about to do uh, aqueous and hydrothermal synthesis routes. Um, and, and so we are collecting these, we're writing a paper on this, and we'll release this data set uh, with the paper. Um, there's sort of one thing you actually have to do when you want to do thermal chemistry on this, that there's a lot of unspoken reagents um, in papers. And that's just because like, you say do synthesis in air and nobody talks about the oxygen or the nitrogen. Nobody lists that. And again, so when you balance reactions, so the only way you can do thermochemistry is with balanced reactions, you have to kind of do a, a complementum with O2. Often you release CO2, right, if you start with a carbonate. Uh, sometimes you have a hydrate and you release water. So we do a sort of singular value decomposition problem almost where we kind of project into this space and see what needs to be added or subtracted. And then we actually have balanced reactions that you can actually do like enthalpy balances on and actually do uh, thermochemistry on. Okay, so 
This is kind of where we are with the data extraction. We are largely done with solid state synthesis. As, as I said, we'll probably release data within the next few months. Um, we haven't done a lot of data mining, but I was just going to show you a, 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 a tiny bit. And most of it is just like looking at the data, uh, not even doing a lot of machine learning on. Um, and so the first is sort of precursors, right? You can now look at sort of statistical information on how often do people use certain precursors. And OK, so again, there's a quiz here, right? Um, what's the most common manganese precursor for if you make manganese oxides? Oxide experts in the room? Oh, you want to rethink that guess? <laughs> it's actually manganese oxides, if you go by papers. Uh, frequency is uh, manganese oxide. Manganese carbon is the second most prevalent precursor. Um, and then, you know, other things, right, like MN2O3 and so. But now a, let me ask a more complicated question. So when I first learned synthesis, I went on sabbatical to France, and you know France has great solid state chemists, right? And, and there are all these heuristic rules that people have, right? And, 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 and one of them that I often heard a lot is if you're making a compound with a certain valence state in, like, say, manganese 2, you'd like to start with a manganese 2 plus precursor, right? Because then you don't have to do oxidation reduction. And the question is, how often is that true, right? So now we can do that because we know what people made. We have scripts that can figure out the valence states, and we know the valence states in the precursor. So he, here's a violin plot, which actually shows this is the valence in the target, and then this is the precursor. And for example, indeed, manganese carbonate is very often used to make manganese 2 plus compounds. Right? The, the, the 2 plus in the target dominates here. You rarely use it to make manganese 4 plus, because to make manganese 4 plus, you're much more li likely to start from manganese oxide. And MnO2, of course, right? Um, uh, you can make any valence because, of course, you can do oxidation reduction, right? It's not like it's impossible, but clearly is used a lot more to make the higher valent manganese oxides, right? Because you don't have to go through the trouble of doing a reducing atmosphere. So there's definitely some truth to this rule. It's, it's by no means an absolute rule, clearly, right? But there is some truth to it that the valence of the precursor dominates the valence of the, the product. Okay. So we are trying to figure out, to be honest, we're actually still trying to figure out how exactly, with what formalism, we're going to learn synthesis uh, from this. Uh, but sometimes we look at simple things like, can we figure out if precursors are substitutionable for each other, right? If you do a reaction and you do it so with the carbonate, could you do it with the oxide, for example, right? And, and we don't have particularly good metrics for that. But so one that we look at is just what's the sintering temperature used? Basically, what's the highest temperature in the reaction, which is probably the one where you do the reaction, right? And so, you know, if you actually look at, for example, reactions that use iron oxide, right? Uh, versus uh, uh, um, uh, reaction that use FEC204, right, the hydrate form, you find a very different temperature distribution. The oxide is used in high temperature reaction, right? The other precursor is used in much lower temperature, very often because it's used with aqueous uh, solutions and so, right? So you would think of these as different precursors. They are used in different synthesis recipes. If you now look for calcium uh, precursors, calcium oxide and calcium arsine, they have extremely different temperature profiles. And that makes some sense, right? That stuff you can make with calcium carbonate, probably very often you can make it with calcium oxide, because the carbonate probably very often decomposes to the calcium oxide uh, uh, when it's reacting. So you can learn sort of simple things like that. But again, we're not particularly far along like that. So we thought we'd try to learn something more complicated. And we, we tried to learn, like, when can you do what we call one-shot synthesis? And so one-shot synthesis. It's kind of the first thing you do when you go to a lab. I have to make something. I'm going to take common precursors, grind them up, fire them, and hope for the best, right? That's what we call one-shot synthesis. And so you take the common precursors, grind them, mix them, calcine them, et cetera. So in contrast, what is not simple synthesis, right, uh, or what we call not one-shot is maybe you want to do a sol gel preparation. Maybe you want just things to, to better mix your precursors, right, ball milling them, make an aqueous slurry of them, stuff like that. Sometimes maybe you want to reheat, right? You want to sort of fire, grind again, reheat. That's, that's all called complex for us. OK, so, uh, so the question is, how well can we predict this uh, with machine learning? And I'm still not sure if this result is true. I mean, it's mathematically true in the sense that it's not like we messed up the way to calculation. But with machine learning, you always have to be very careful what your prediction mean. And it seems like with 75% uh, uh, of the time, we can predict that common precursors will work, 
Now, 64% uh, of the time, we can accurately predict that one-step synthesis will work. There's a but here, right? So there's a reason that common precursors are common. They dominate most of the synthesis reactions. So uh, the, the, the answer that I should be giving you really is like, how many reactions do common precursors? Because that's my baseline. And, and probably around 50% of reactions use common precursors, so I'm only predicting a little better than the baseline, right? Because if I made a machine that just says common precursor all the time, I'm probably already getting 40, 50% accuracy. Um, the same with one-step synthesis, right? Most synthesis described in the literature are one-step synthesis, right? They basically, I take this, I mix it, I fire it. They actually even say that even when they did other things, right? That's the problem, so, okay. Uh, maybe one more complex piece of data, and then I'll end, is like we are interested, of course, in battery cathodes, and we collected all the data on NMC cathodes, right? So uh, lithium metal oxide cathodes where uh, things are nickel, cobalt, manganese, in some cases aluminum, and we look as a, as a, frac as a function of the amount of nickel in the material, right? Uh, we look at sort of what the highest temperature is, this is essentially the sintering temperature, and what the environment is that the material uh, is made in. Uh, and red is oxygen here, um, this kind of like yellowish color is air, and then there's hydrogen. And what you indeed see is that uh, when you go to higher nickel content, there's a lot more synthesis in air, uh, in, in oxygen, sorry. And that's because you have to oxidize nickel to nickel three, which we all know, but it's kind of fine. It's interesting to see that the computer can also uh, sort of uh, figure it out. So I think with that, I'm going to uh, end here. I. Um, I stand by my, uh, my statement that I think we should try to use machine learning for problems we can't solve with other ways, right? Um, and machine learning requires data. I know I'm saying the obvious here, but in, in material science, that is not a trivial statement, right? That there's a lot of talk about doing ma machine learning in material science, but we don't have a lot of good data, right? I've had great conversations today with students and, and everybody struggles with getting a data set of 100 points, 300 points. But you know, when you talk to the Facebook people, they don't look at you when you say 300 points, right? They go like, you know, we have 75 million, right? Like something like that. So there's a lot of techniques that, that work when you have 75 million and we're never gonna be there, right? So uh, this is why we focused on this problem that can we extract the data first, right? Can we generate the data by machine? Uh, and the reason we focused on synthesis is because we felt synthesis is a well-contained uh, problem, right? If you say I'm going to data mine uh, electrical conductivity in papers, uh, it's all over the place. People don't give you all the variables. People don't say, you know, if you data mine, uh, we did this as an experiment. If you look for papers and you look for the electrical conductivity of copper, right? It's all over the place. And people, by the way, don't say what they did to the copper. And as you all know, as good metallurgists, right, you know that whether you heat treated it with the impurity level, the oxygen level, the hard working of it, it all matters for the conductivity. And if people don't sort of say that clearly in the paper, there's no way you're gonna data mine the, the, the conductivity. And this is a bit the problem with extracting properties automatically from the literature, right? And the reason we did synthesis is because we felt at least we have a chance here, right? We know that description of synthesis isn't always correct, but it's probably not as bad as some of the property description in the sense that you have most of the variables in here. So hopefully, you know, when I come back in a few years, right, we will actually have machine learned synthesis, but we're not there yet. So with that, I thank you. And again, I want to thank you for the, the wonderful visit here. So. Questions? Mm -hmm. This is wonderful work. I think there's a huge potential. Um, so about coming now, right? <laughs> 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 it's about coming. Yeah, the butt is a little bit, um, there's some, something not satis satisfied in me in the following way. You have made a lot of decisions in this process that you use to parse the literature. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you have treated the words as strings, but you could have treated them as tuples of syllables in a different way. So in a way, I see us somewhat back to what Roger said at the beginning. So here we have an observation, he said. How do I know how statistically significant is that? And if I rephrase that, here we have an algorithm, but how do I know that how that competes to competing algorithms? Is there any way to assess the quantity of the strategy that you've chosen 
in comparison to alt alternatives that would work with different decisions and the various models. Right, yeah, it's a fair point, right? So. Um, First of all, in the second part, they're not really treated as strings. They're, they're, we're starting to interpret them, right? So, but um, I mean, obviously, we do the sort of standard way of verifying how things work. But by working with annotated data sets, leaving out part of the data, and trying to predict that, and that's sort of standard in machine learning. But there's obviously a certain bias there, right? That um, what I've learned is that even when you do these leave out scores, um, you're it's rare that your data is representative of the full universe of data, right? And because of the way you bias, the way you collected the data. So, um, um, but are there alg other algorithms that, that would be better? It's possible, but I think we will have to try. We already try a lot of algorithms, right? I showed you the best working that we have tried, right? But remember, you, we're already getting up to very high levels of precision we're sort of solving the one minus x problem here, right? Which is like, you know, where it looks like we have great precision and now every percent we get buys us a lot, right? Because of the error rate. But we've actually tried a lot of algorithms already. My worry, my deeper worry is that there are completely different approaches that will work better, right? So we're, we're sort of locked into this data acquisition parsing, you know, topic classification, neural network kind of, right? And, and maybe some brilliant person is going to come up. I have a completely different way that I'm going to extract stuff from text. That's actually my deeper fear, right? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, this is a rapidly moving field, right? You know, we thought for a while, could you work with templating? Uh, uh, but we haven't seen anything, anything good in that. So for example, I'll tell you, uh, there are th ways where sometimes success comes out of a, a, a surprising corner. So it seems like the best way for us to read formulas in OCR, like in, in photographic, is to treat them as an image. And to actually train a computer by, we write for, we have the computer make formulas up artificially, right? We turn them into an image, we distort it by any level, and, and since the computer now knows what it was, it can learn, right? It can learn that basically hundreds of millions of things because it's a trivial operation. Rather than for us to try to learn OCR, I can write basically almost every possible chemical formula down and teach the computer how it's going to look like photographically. And you know, it's not something I thought about in the beginning of the project, but then you go like, you know, wow, this makes a lot more sense, right? And in the beginning, everybody tries to do OCR and then correct all the errors. That's sort of the, the logical way to do it, right? And then sometimes, you, I, I agree with you, sometimes you have to step back and go like, you know, there's a much better way to do this, right? And that would be where, but a lot of these methods, this would have been, what you just showed would have been impossible at, at, at before 2013. Like right? yeah. word to vec yeah. is the thing that's transformed a lot of the NLP totally. Mm -hmm. And another part is the one of actually taking and uh, putting a fence around the kinds of papers you're going to look at and what you can assume should be in there. If you had started doing all scientific papers, you wouldn't have performed anywhere near this. It's a great example because I'll give you an So the first thing I showed you where we learn about the thermoelectric, that was trained on abstracts only, not on papers. If you give that method the full paper, it performs more poorly because it's actually confused now, mm. right? You know, and you know why? Because in abstracts, people talk about the important stuff, most people, right? Whereas if you read a whole paper, there's a lot of other stuff, and now the word to vec gets much more confused. So it was critical to train that part on abstracts only. So it sounds like it's converging on this, but I'm wondering if it's going to affect the way scientific journals evolve now, because you know we have spell checks and grammar checks, we have plagiarism checks, and is there going to be a envelope that evolves mm -hmm. that does this kind of stuff? Yeah. So you submit something to the journal, and it runs it through some software, and says, you know, do you mean this? Yeah. Looking for <laughs> clarifying <laughs> statements. <laughs> You know, I think it would be great, right? Because you could say, like, uh, uh, you know, run it through a few basic filters and say, like, I can't figure out your synthesis, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I wish I'd brought a few more examples. There are some, some crazy ways people have written things, right? Like, where, <laughs> sometimes you think it's written by a six-year-old, right? That, that, you know, uh, it's really, I took the cruise. I mean, there are people, right? I took the crucible from, from the shelf and, you know, I mean, stuff like that. that um, and I think that would be useful, right? To, or when people refer to things, right? There are very basic checks you can do in paper. You know, I mean, there's stuff people refer to figures that are not in the paper, for example, right? <laughs> that, that, that's an easy machine learning. 
people miss, you know, you know how you, you change the numbers on your figures and then that never got updated in the text, right? So there's a bunch of really easy tests you could do on papers by machines and, and it would make writing better, right? Yeah. Well, it also brings up the point about the licensing or access to data too, because yeah. so Elsevier now, it would be about six or seven years ago, they invited everyone to give their data and they said you could read papers, but then they made it, you would sign a license agreement that would restrict how many words you could access out of a paper. They, that caused a big row and they had to go back, but I think you now have no access to your Elsevier papers. Because the UC system just... It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a subtle issue. <laughs> to sign the contract, yeah. uh, paying them the money. Yeah. Uh, so the UC system, by the way, publishes more than 10% of all papers in Elsevier in the US. So it's a big dog, and as you know, Elsevier is not cheap, right? Yeah. So you're looking at the English language. Have you considered <laughs> <laughs> it might be easier in some other languages that uh -huh. don't have the complexity well, of English? Because uh, Unfortunately, I want to read German and Russian, and German is even worse, <laughs> right? What about Chinese? Chinese would be good, right? But uh, you know, you'd have to retrain everything, right? And, and again, because Chinese is very different in nature, right? Um, but so, so we did a completeness test, right? We looked at some limited data sets that people had compiled manually of synthesis recipes. And you know, everything we're missing is either from the Russian literature or the old German literature, right? That's sort of dominant. There's a lot of synthesis described in, the, in Russian papers and Ukrainian papers. Um, but I think we're gonna stick to English for a bit, like, I mean, it's already enough work. <laughs> so do you think there should be a better, like, a project materials project for uh, failed experiments. Scientifically yeah. sound, but mm -hmm. failed experiments, because you learn a lot from what didn't That's work, right. but the paper gets published. That's part of your training data that there's so much data mm -hmm. out there we have no access to. Yeah. I, I, you bring up a great point, right? So what, uh, you know, the, 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 the failed data um, problem I don't think is going to be solved anytime soon, right? Because uh, first of all, let's assume that s researchers will do this, right? Which I'm not convinced of. Uh, it's going to take us 20 years to build up enough data that it's meaningful. Uh, but I don't think research is going to do this. So we have found our experience uh, when we did the materials genome, right? And again, that's a while ago now, and maybe things have changed. Our experiences was quite negative trying to commit the research community to do even very basic data management. Uh, and the government wasn't helpful either uh, because maybe they didn't quite see the value of it yet. And I think maybe if you go back to the government now, they might see the value of it. Um, but I'm not particularly hopeful. There's also a time lag issue. And I think this is what a software person really would have to solve. Nobody wants to at the time you're working on something, which is when you have all the information, you don't want to dump it on the web because it shows what you're working on, right? So what there really should be is an app where you dump it all, but it doesn't get released. And then when your paper's published, you flip the switch and now it all gets released. So what I found with my own students is that is that's sort of the problem that, but then when the paper's written, they don't have any interest in it anymore, right? In the papers. So it's like you, you have to do all the work while you're doing the research, but not disclose it. And so that time lag, is a, is a practical problem. And the other one is that, you know, the government finally needs to get to this and need to do central data storage, right? This is not going to get solved any other way. So uh, materials genome, I thought, was quite successful on the computational side. I don't think it's been particularly successful on the compilation of experimental data, right? So that was the other side of the materials genome, which never really got executed. I think it could have, but I don't think it was done because it was a little harder, but I don't think it was impossible. But isn't part of that question too what we're seeing in pharmaceuticals where uh, pharmaceutical company and the government knows it's a big problem, pharmaceutical companies can start 10 studies and then they choose to only publish the one that shows their drug is slightly better than the competition and then they can get approved and the nine that, that showed any bad effects never get published. Right, so now they're supposed to at least register that they're doing studies and try and are supposed to report negatively. Sure. Yeah, uh, so I think you uh, understand all the challenge <laughs> that can happen during the information extract extraction process. So if you are the publisher or like if you're in charge of Elsevier or 
uh, every other publisher. So how do you want to change the way like uh, people publish their paper? Well, I would do two things. First, I would do what John says, right? Like do a very basic test on sort of what I would say, like readability of paper, I, I, maybe that's not the right word, right? But is information easily extracted from papers? That's, that's what I would do, right? And then the second one is, I think that a minimum data set that should be publicly available is all data used in the figures that appear in the paper, right? I thought that was also a well-bounded set, right? For a while, you know, the government was thinking of all the data used in your research, and that's just an unbounded set, right? Like, if I calibrate my piece of equipment, should I send you that data? And nobody wants that data either, right? So, uh, and I think that's what publishers should do, but the publishers should get together because this needs to be in one or a few places, right? This can be like, you know, if you write a proposal today, you have a data plan, and a data plan just means that you store it somewhere, right? It doesn't even have to be publicly accessible, and it doesn't have to be easily accessible. So the publishers have to kind of figure, have to realize that data has to be like API accessible, right? You know, do you know today, a lot of data is in supplementary information of papers, right? If you take a supplementary information of a paper and you take a sentence out of it and you put it in Google, Google does not find that. So supplementary information of papers, uh, you can actually just as well bury it in the ground. Because nobody reads it and you can't find it on the internet, which today means it doesn't exist, right? right? So this is how bad the data situation is actually today, right? So a lot of times in uh, reading synthesis processes, the author says this was important and this was important. And then when you try to repeat that, you find out some other things were actually really important too that aren't in there. So in your analysis, as you're overlapping these certain synthesis techniques, do you find this paper left off something that 300 other papers said was important and can improve on the understanding of the synthesis? So. Uh, we have not done that kind of analysis yet. It's on our radar screen. Yeah. Um, we, we want to start looking at variability, like when you take common compounds, for example, variability on synthesis. Um, there's a sort of part to that which is more diplomatic. You have to be more diplomatic. Are some authors better than others? Right? Are some journals better than others? Right? Some more pointed that they leave it out of purpose. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, fair. And, our hope is that, not that every synthesis as published is reproducible, I, I think we cannot hope for that, but our hope is that there's enough good data that machines can learn from them, right? Mm -hmm. Because humans can learn even in noisy environments, and, and trust me, if, if you need to do machine learning on perfect data, then the machine learning is useless, right? If the data has to be perfect, you're never gonna get there, right? Even the crystal structure database has errors in it, let me tell you, I, I, we actually found some in the process. So I think any good machine learning method worth its salt is, should, should be able to deal with some fraction of poor information. Uh, so, uh, let, let me ask it in a slightly different way. As a process engineer, there are things that are easy to measure, temperatures and yeah. things like that. But there might be things that are difficult to measure that are really important. And, and do you expect that will fall out of this type of analysis? I don't think so. I actually think we will only get coarse relations. At least that's what I see at this stage, right? We will understand like, you know, if I'm making oxides, which PO2 I need, like which precursor, precursor maybe PO2 relation, things like that. Which precursors work well with other precursors, right? Which is sometimes an issue. Uh, I can't quite see us come up with sort of complexity in synthesis, right? Yeah, maybe one thing I wanna add that the long-term goal is to merge this with the data in the materials project, which has thermochemistry, right? Because can you really learn synthesis just from seeing it done, you know, this reacts with that? But if you get basic thermochemical information, then you can start seeing interesting patterns. I'll, I'll give you an example, right? What we're already starting to see is that you pick precursors based on, um, uh, there's some relation to the delta geo formation of the compound from the precursors, right? So. With some precursors, you tend to fall in a trap in the phase diagram, which is not the state you want to make, and then you have very little driving force to get to the minimum, and it takes forever. And taking forever, what that translates to is you have impurity phases, right, because you didn't do full conversion. So we're already starting to see that, that uh, sometimes you pick precursors to not have impurity phases. But to make sense of that, you need to couple to the phase diagrams on thermochemistry. 
And that's really the power of this in the long term, right? That you can start merging this with, with, with calculated, with measured other information, right? I don't think we're going to learn great synthesis just from this, right? So in organic synthesis, you, why, didn't you, why did you not use patent literature? Well, we because that parse is yeah, easier yeah. to the examples. Yeah. And for organic synthesis, at least, that would help. Yeah. Except that most patents, everyone only wants to put the first way they made it because it was the least good. And it passes the requirement for teaching. And then you figure out how to really make it. Fun. Yeah, so we are planning to do patents. We just haven't gotten to it yet. But it's on our radar screen. So when Google started their shopping results and their Google will, will scrape the web for you and give you what these websites are trying to tell you, they didn't do any of this. They just came out with an XML schema and said, look, if you want to be indexed, this is what you've got to do. Do you have any hope for something similar in uh, that scientists will do that? <laughs> um, obviously, it's a publisher. Yeah. Yeah. That would be mm -hmm. a publisher. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, I think your generation will do this, but not this generation. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, the younger generation, I think, you know, is just trained differently. I, I always see this in conversation. They probably have no issue with it. They go like, sure, I'll do that, right? But I think that it's going to be a while for that to turn over. I mean, if you make a material, it's actually, it would be very easy to have a schema where you put in the synthesis in some kind of schema form, right? That would actually, I mean, that'd be like an extra 10 minutes work when you write your paper. But somebody has to provide it. Somebody has to drive this to set up the, the, the kind of norms and the standards, right? And, and, and you know, I can't, you, you won't believe how many town hall meetings, I hate town halls, I, I, I think they're terrible, um, that I had where people would argue about formats and this and that. And I go like, you know, nobody gives a damn about your format. Just write it down and you can convert it, right? But, in that sense, the scientific community is kind of a step behind, I got to say, right? That like, as you say, you should have a bunch of XML tags, right? <laughs> and I don't really care how you format the thing. And, and maybe you even give it the wrong name, right? Maybe grinding and mixing is the same thing, but I can deal with all that later. I can post-process things, right? And people like have spent way too many hours thinking about formats. Oh, I need a, a, like a template, like a spreadsheet that I fill in. This is never going to work because in the next day, you'll find out another synthesis method, and it's not in the template, right? We tried this in my group, and it was a nightmare. Like, I mean, it was a complete nightmare. Like, you, you think you have a system. Within 10 minutes, somebody goes like, this doesn't work for me. Right? Like, that, that, that's how, how, how bad it is. And one last. Jeffrey? Yeah. <clears throat> this is something that you and I discussed mm -hmm. a lot. What's the, what's the risk of a type 2 error? And then it going, you know, percolating and then going haywire. So some, some formulation is predicted and it's wrong. And then it gets perpetuated. Again, we're sort of, maybe I don't understand the question and then tell me, but we are not trying to make an encyclopedic database of synthesis recipes, right? Because that would be hard. We're trying to get enough good data that we can learn from it. So I hope that errors won't bug us. I think synthesis is sort of local problem. I have had problems where singular errors can wipe out a lot of data, contaminate a lot of data. Um, a, a funny example is that if you make phase diagrams, the results are non-local because phase diagrams is a global energy optimization. And if you have one point that's really low, er erroneously, it, it removes everything, everything else. So it's a funny story, but then I'll end it. It's only 30 seconds. So, when I was working on this big Duracell project that I talked about yesterday, uh, we were six months into the project uh, doing DFT calculations. And at some point, some of, one of us sits around and goes like, how come there are no nickel oxides that ever come up? They should have the right redox potential, the right stability in alkaline media. And I go like, we did all this high throughput, and this doesn't make any sense. So it turns out that density functional theory makes a very serious error on nickel oxide. It, it, it overly stabilizes nickel peroxide. And nickel peroxide is so unbelievably incorrectly stable that it removes every possible nickel oxide from ground state stability. And so for six months, we hadn't noticed that. We call this the recurring error because, by the way, the problem with high throughput computing is also high throughput error making, right? Um, and so, you know, every, every year there's some young student who starts and starts a bunch of calculations 
and reintroduces the nickel peroxide <laughs> error in the database and suddenly whoosh, everything disappears. Um, so we now have a filter on peroxides like because we've sort of learned to recognize this error. So I don't think synthesis is in this category, but I could be wrong, right? It could be that there's some wrong error that totally contaminates everything else. Great. So I, let's thank our speaker. I think this is a great.